One of the most heavily militarized zones in the world. A dividing line which is not a defined border but has the legitimacy of one. A place where soldiers from India and Pakistan are locked in an eyeball to eyeball conflict at all times. A place where exchange of fire is routine. This is the line of control the line that separates the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir from Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Beyond travelled to the LOC in the Tangdhar sector in Jammu and Kashmir to see how the Indian army actually secures this line and what does it mean for troops guarding this imaginary line. We began our journey in Kupwara and drove up the Serpentine Highway to the Nashta Chun Pass to be greeted by heavy snow and a small anecdote. We are standing at the altitude of almost 10,000 feet and what you see behind me is the snow-covered top of the Nashta Chun Pass, now more famously known as the Sadna Pass. Locals say that it was after the 1965 war between India and Pakistan, the famous film star of that era, Sadhana, visited Indian Army soldiers in these areas in a bid to boost their morale and this place came to be known after her name ever since. Ensuring that this pass remains operational through the winters is one of the key responsibilities of the Indian Army since this pass is the only access to some of the remotest locations on the line of control. The LOC is just 26 kilometers from here. The Sadna Pass has considerable strategic value. It's like a cockpit offering a 360 degree view of India and Pakistan. From here, one can see many of the mountain ranges in POK. Back to the highway and some hours later, we reach a forward post located just meters from the LOC. The post faces a mountain. This is enemy territory. The senior Indian Army officer accompanying us announced. In front of us was Pakistan-occupied Kashmir and this was the line of control. So what is the LOC? LOC is a 740-kilometer-long line dividing India and Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. It came into effect in July 1972 after India and Pakistan signed the Shimla Agreement. LOC is not a legally recognized boundary, but is the de facto border in this region. The Shimla Agreement signed on July 2, 1972 by Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and Pakistan President Zulfikar Ali Bhutto mandated that in Jammu and Kashmir, the line of control resulting from the ceasefire of December 17, 1971 would be respected by both sides without prejudice to the recognized position of either side. The agreement further laid down that neither side would seek to alter the LOC unilaterally, irrespective of mutual differences and legal interpretations. Both countries further undertook to refrain from the threat or the use of force in violation of this line. But what was agreed upon in Shimla is violated by Pakistan on a daily basis. A day when there is no firing from the Pakistani side on Indian positions is rare. The Indian side too retaliates. The 2017 saw unprecedented escalation in firing and infiltration bids by Pakistan, more than 800 violations. It underscored the irrelevance of the 2003 ceasefire agreed upon when Parvez Musharraf was president. The Pakistanis began undermining the ceasefire in 2009 and haven't stopped. The Pakistani army does not appear to care that it is endangering its own people whose villages lie a few hundred meters from the LOC. 
We are at the line of control in Kashmir and what you see behind me is enemy territory. Many such villages in Pakistani occupied Kashmir are clearly visible from the Indian side. Some of these villages are often used as launch pads by the enemy to try and infiltrate terrorists into Indian territory. Keeping a close watch on these villages and the movement which happens there is a key component of a soldier's duty who is posted in these forward areas. We spot a Pakistani military post high up on another mountain. All around us, on our side of the LOC, there are Indian Army posts. What you see behind me is a Pakistani post right on top of that hill. There are multiple locations all along the line of control where either the enemy or our own troops are occupying dominating heights. Intermittent firing from the other side is routine here and is responded to appropriately each time it happens. Also dotting the area are Indian posts where soldiers maintain a 24-hour vigil to maintain the sanctity of the LOC. Dushman aapko dekh raha hai or the enemy is watching you is much more than a signboard here. It's a constant reminder to our soldiers that they cannot afford to let their guard down even for a moment. The constant challenge for Indian soldiers is to prevent terrorists from sneaking in. So they are on guard round the clock, come snow or hail, monitoring the enemy, tracking his movements, always alert to the possibility of an infiltration bed. Our duty is that we have given our area of responsibility, which we have to stop infiltration and give our duty to alertness. Okay. So how do we try to stop infiltration here? This means that the POK, which is filled with militants, has more chances of infiltration. Then we also give our duty to alert so that we can stop it. Most Pakistani ceasefire violations are meant to provide cover for terrorists trying to infiltrate. The topography of the area helps them. There is dense vegetation, hills, gorges and valleys provide cover for infiltrating terrorists. Challenge is even greater at nights when there is zero visibility. Night vision devices and thermal images come in handy. The Pakistani troops sitting across the line of control never seem to give up. If not firing on Indian Army positions during the day, they are constantly probing, seeking a weak spot in Indian defences through which they can infiltrate armed terrorists at night. So guarding the line of control is not easy and it becomes even more challenging when pitch darkness serves to cloak an infiltrating terrorist. This is why the Indian Army resorts to night patrols and ambushes. The idea being to catch the infiltrating enemy by surprise. It's a cold winter night at the line of control and the Indian Army has got specific inputs that the enemy is likely to carry out an infiltration bid into Indian territory. The Indian Army soldiers have readied themselves and are now proceeding on a patrol and ambush to thwart any such attempt. Jashop! Jaint! Sriman! Aapke briefing ke liye! Yek Jashop! It takes considerable training and practice to master the art of walking on narrow snow-covered mountain paths at night. But these soldiers know the ground, yet they tread carefully, each maintaining a predefined distance from the other and keeping a hawk's eye on their surroundings. The enemy could be lurking in any corner of these snow-covered slopes, something the Indian Jawan knows better than anyone else. The night vision devices these troops wear provide a clear view of the heavily forested areas they move in. Any intruder can be spotted. Temperatures in these areas can plummet to minus 10 degrees Celsius in winters, but the cold is no deterrent for these men. The job has to be done.
Once the designated point is reached, they take their positions and the ambush is laid. The ambush has been laid and now the wait begins. This wait can extend from a few hours to all through the night. And while sitting in these positions, these men have to remain absolutely still for hours together so as to maintain a tactical advantage over the adversary. The sub-zero temperatures here are no deterrent for these men for whom the call of duty comes first. It could take a few hours or even the entire night. For that matter, it's not even clear if infiltrators will attempt this route. But the job has to be done, come night or day, in hot weather or sub-zero cold. For the enemy is just across with all the advantages. He decides when and where to infiltrate and how to do it. He has to succeed only once, but the Javans facing him have to succeed every time in blocking an infiltration bed. During daytime, a key task for Indian troops is to carry out a fence check. The concertina wide fence is one critical component in the effort to prevent infiltration. Areas around the fence are heavily mined and need to be checked too. Also, there are places where Indian army posts are located outside the fence. It's a high-risk location as they are in plain view of Pakistani border action teams looking to strike. To prevent cross-border terrorism from the Pakistani side, the Indian government has constructed a fence all along the line of control. And maintaining this fence and ensuring that there are no breaches is one of the primary tasks of the Indian Army located here. These checks are routinely carried out in daytime. They are carried out multiple times in a day. And the focus is to detect any breaches from where an infiltrator could sneak in. Also, since these areas are heavily mined, these personnel use mine sweeping devices to ensure that they do not run into any mines while guarding this fence. There are challenges in keeping such a large body of troops motivated. A daily routine helps, but boredom can set in, which means troops could be less alert. This is where officers' empathy for their troops matters. The better they know and understand them, the earlier they can detect slackness or indiscipline maybe even recognize the onset of depression in a Jawan. While serving here on the line of control, the troops and officers face uh, similar cha challenges but uh, to varying degrees. Maintaining vigil in such a high intensity operational area all throughout is part of the operational challenge. The roads are cut off frequently during winters. This leads to certain amount of physical discomfort, which may be included as part of the administrative challenges. Not being able to speak to the near and dear ones for a long time when the network or the telephone line is out, these form part of the psychological challenges. And the harsh terrain, the weather conditions, and uh, the rarefied atmosphere bring in a little bit of physical discomfort, which form part of the physical challenges. But since our army being a highly experienced and highly trained army, we take these problems uh, in our stride and overcome them. All soldiers who are serving here have volunteered for the Indian Army. The second factor is self-honor and self-respect called Izzat, which a soldier holds very close to his heart, is one of the biggest motivation factors. There is the regimental affiliation or the regimental spirit or uh, how should I say, Nam, Namak or Nishan which is a core motivating, motivating factor for a soldier. And lastly, uh, the commitment which a soldier uh, has towards the safety and security of his motherland is the ultimate motivating factor. We always have emergency medical uh, supplies and stores well stocked at every post. In addition to this, we have qualified manpower who can administer first aid. As soon as a casualty takes place, the first aid is administered to that particular person by troops from that particular post. Apart from that, our medical teams are put into action and all effort is ensured towards safe evacuation of that casualty to a army medical setup as soon as possible. Caring for their men helps officers fight the enemy better 
but the entire unit is also there to help the civilian population providing whatever succor they can in these remote locations. The role here is uh, quite diversified. Uh, for many, uh, in many parts of my battalion AOR, there are villages which are remote and uh, located at very far away from the administrative setup. So the only option which is available to these villages is to come to the nearest army post. Uh, be it uh, provision of emergency medical aid, or be it evacuation of a medical casualty, or be it uh, rescuing uh, victims of in, in an accident, or be it clearing a landslide, or for that matter, even dousing forest fires. The civilians keep coming to us, and we readily oblige. In this manner, the army here is involved in nation building, and we as soldiers, we take a lot of pride in it. Walking down from this post, we enter a valley where Titwal village nestles. Here, the Kishanganga River separates India from Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. We are standing on the Titwal bridge and beyond this white line is Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. This is the river Kishanganga which is flowing in POK territory. This river is called Neelam in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Behind me is a Pakistan post. There you can see the Pakistan flag. On the hill over us is a highway running in POK territory. This is the closest one can get to Pakistan-occupied Kashmir in this sector. Teetwal is where people from either side cross over to meet friends, relatives and even seal family weddings. Those crossing over from India to POK can avail of 28-day visa facility issued in Teetwal. Vion visited the Army Goodwill School in Titwal where local children get an education in addition to valuable computer skills. I am really motivated from Army and one day I will work hard and become an Army officer and that is my dream. At a community facility nearby, young girls are taught skills like tailoring which would enable them to contribute financially to their families. In 2005, the Indian Army opened the T12 Community Development Center and we have learned the skills of this center and the skills of this center. We can learn some beautiful skills and earn some money for ourselves. The school and community center seem very normal from close-up. But lift your eyes to the horizon and one realizes that the line of control is only meters away. To many of us, it is enemy territory. But there are people living here who are related to those on the other side. So even amidst enmity, there is love and hope for the future. Being battle ready at all times is the first and foremost requirement for a soldier guarding the line of control. He needs to be tough, both physically and psychologically, to be effective, particularly on the LOC, where there is constant jockeying for physical and psychological dominance. That physical and psychological toughening is done at the 15 core battle school in Kru, about an hour's drive from Srinagar. The school orients and trains 35,000 officers and men every year before they proceed for deployment on the LOC or in the hinterland where they will be engaged in counter-terrorism and counter-insurgency operations. Obstacle courses are just the beginning. Firing is regarded as the most critical part of the training regime. The men are trained to fire while moving in buddy pairs, firing while crawling under enemy fire, and are instructed on how to respond when fired upon in civilian populated areas. Troops get their first taste of what they could encounter while launching ambushes and patrols. Night ambush training readies them towards action in the pitch darkness it teaches them how to pinpoint the direction from where they are being fired upon despite zero visibility. 
Another key component of training at 15 CBS includes operating in civilian areas where the chances of collateral damage are immense. An entire village, christened Takhribal, has been set up at this training school to simulate a real village environment. Training at Takhribal provides soldiers a taste of what they'll encounter while conducting operations in villages, either on the line of control or in areas in the valley. Before being deployed at the line of control, soldiers of the Indian Army are made to undergo intensive training at the 15 Core Battle School in Kru near Srinagar. This is the place where these soldiers are trained for all the challenges they are going to face all along the LOC where the enemy would be watching them most of the times. And as the motto of 15 CBS goes, future victories begin here. We train them to fight, they fight to kill is the mantra the 15 CBS lives by. And while 15 CBS trains them to be combat ready, another key facility in the Kashmir Valley operates round the clock to save lives of soldiers getting injured in the line of fire. The 92 base hospital is a lifeline for troops serving in Kashmir. It usually begins with a phone call and the hooter goes off, alerting those on duty that injured soldiers are on their way. Night or day is irrelevant. Senior doctors and staff of the 92 base hospital or 92 BH as it's usually referred to are always prepared. They know that even a moment's delay can mean the difference between life and death. Why you go to the cannula guy forward madam? Quickly, put a red tab on him. He's priority one. There is no better place than the 92 BH to treat soldiers injured in Pakistani firing from across the line of control and in counter-terrorism and counter-insurgency operations in the valley. The hospital has an illustrious history. 92 BH, uh, now we are 75 years. We completed 75 years. It was you know, raised in 1942 on 10th September at Rawalpindi. This was during the World War II. And then probably it moved to Bengal in 1943 stayed there for some time, came back to Devlali and then in 1946 it moved to Japan. This was all part of World War II movement. Then it came back to India where it was reorganized at Pune in 1947 and 1948, 2nd October, finally was relocated at Srinagar. 92 BH is a 598 bedded hospital with all basic specialities and lab facilities. It also has super specialists on the surgical side. 2017 was a tough year with 92 BH receiving a steady stream of injured soldiers from all over Jammu and Kashmir. Yeah, we've had a share of casualties for the last year onwards. There's a spike in the number of casualties reaching this hospital. Majority of the cases are either because of gunshot wounds and splinter injuries. Besides these two categories of wounds, we've also had share of injuries due to stone pelting, you know, weather disturbances like avalanches and, you know, cold injuries. They also, this is on the surgical side. Other trauma cases or evacuations, what we get is also from the medical sides because of the adverse weather conditions. So we've had a share of cases of HAPO, you know, in this kind of high altitude terrain. We get, we're getting plenty of stroke cases also as well as heart attacks. So these are the kind of spectrum of uh, diseases or disabilities or injuries what we are getting. 
Personnel from Central Police Organizations are also brought to 92 BH for treatment. We met CRPF Constable Malame Samadhan who was injured during a recent terror attack and had a bullet lodged near his lungs. Actually, this is a young uh, CRPF soldier who was involved in a uh, militant uh, attack in Latipur on 31st of December. So, he, uh, in a bullet hit him on his back and uh, it has reached up to the neck and uh, luckily uh, uh, he could survive because it could have breached his lung also or it could have hit his spine also. But there was just a narrow uh, this thing is left and we operated upon him and we have removed the bullet and he's recovering well now. We also met Army Jawan Rakesh recuperating from a bullet wound sustained on the LOC. I was in the post at the time Pakistan had opened fire. तो उन्होंने उनको जवाब दिया फायर से जैसे मैंने फायर बंद किया एक घंटे बाद तो उन्होंने पांच छह मिनट बाद दोबारा फायर खोल दिया और जो राउंड वेरी को जो ठोके मेरे पाँव लगी और उसकी वजह से मेरी स्पोर्ट्स में आ गया ठीक हो के फिर वापस ड्यूटी पे जाने की हाँ जी ड्यूटी आएंगे उसके बाद ड्यूटी पे जाओ हाँ जी सर दोबारा एल पे मिलेगा तो जाओगे हाँ जी सर पक्का जवाब देना उनको पाकिस्तानियों को जवाब देना हाँ जी देर इज अट अड टू दिस ऑल्सो These are various metallic uh, fragments and bullets which we have extricated from the body of the patient. Interestingly, this is a watch which had gone into a major's body inside the abdominal cavity because of the blast effect. Okay. And was taken out during the surgery. Uh -huh. So the time actually had stopped, but the officer did walk out of this <laughs> hospital. So that uh, was there. So we kept them. Sometimes the patients request us to give them those bullets oh, really? or the fragments. Okay. So we always do that because ultimately it has come out of his body and he has borne the brunt of the trauma. The 92 base hospital in Srinagar is often called as the lifeline of the Indian Armed Forces in Jammu and Kashmir. And this is not without reason. Critically injured soldiers from the Indian Army, the paramilitary forces and the state police are brought here for treatment and the kind of success rate this hospital has maintained over the years has now earned it a trust and respect among soldiers which is unparalleled. Will the guns ever fall silent on the LOC? Pakistan has a vested interest in keeping the LOC alive. They see it as a low-cost way of keeping alive their claims to Kashmir. By allowing jihadi groups to infiltrate across the LOC, they are able to control and use them for various other goals including in Afghanistan. As long as the army controls the narrative in Pakistan, the firestorm on the LOC will continue. So as long as bullets continue to fly across the line of control from Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, there will be an Indian Jawan to return the fire, fight back with every means at hand. For Nam, Namak, Nishan.